Well, thank you very much. So, yes, I'm, I'm Mac Gardner. So I'm a retired medical geneticist, um, and I've been on the committee of the Alumnus Association of Medical School for a few years now, and Chris and I have got together there. And um, uh, Terence, Professor Terence Doyle has been the one who's been organizing these talks and the, the history. So the, these talks are under the aegis of the, um, or under the umbrella, I suppose, of the uh, history of medicine uh, format. And um, so I'm aware of that umbrella and I shall use it. Um, but I'll start off by talking about DNA. In fact, I'll be talking about DNA throughout my talk. And so here's my title, there it is in front of you, getting your own DNA tested. Is that interesting? Is it useful? But are there fish hooks? And your criminal relatives should be beware. Well, look, you all know what DNA is. Um, look, and this is not a, a paid commercial from my to 10. It's just their rather clever um, logo there. DIY, it's in our DNA. And everybody knows that's DI is do it yourself. They don't necessarily know that DNA is deoxyribose nucleic acid, but that doesn't matter. Everybody these days knows what DNA is. So that's actually, that's, I thought that was quite clever on their part. Well, what we all know about DNA, it's the genetic material, it's the stuff of heredity. And everyone's DNA is different, except in identical twins, and it's present in just about every body tissue. And these days, it's actually very readily testable. So the stuff of heredity. That's what we're addressing. And as I said, we've got a, an historical umbrella. So let's look at a bit of history. So this is Dunedin in 1865. Um, looking down, looking south in the road, you can see that I think will be Princess Street and Highway 1 going south is somewhere out on the water at this time. So that's 1865 in Dunedin. 1865 in Central Europe, that's when Gregor Mendel, who was an abbot in Brno in the um, Czech Republic at that time, he reported his discovery of plant breeding experiments that led him to the conclusion that in the matter of passing on traits, discrete hereditary factors were involved. He didn't call them genes, that, gene, that word hadn't been invented as yet. And you can see that, that picture there, it's actually from a stamp and he crossed red, sweet peas with white sweet peas and worked out that there were capital, capital R dominant genes and lowercase r recessive genes. And um, that was, he was, as had been spoken of, as the father of genetics. I visited the Abbey at Brno some years ago as a, as a post-conference tour. And unsurprisingly, there's a little museum there devoted to Mendel. And these are actually Mendel's glasses. I actually was rather keen if I could have borrowed them and I might have been able to see my discipline a bit more clearly. Unfortunately, there was a sheet of plastic and I couldn't actually conduct that experiment. Well, Mendel is, he has had the accolade of his name being used like boycott and um, sandwich. He's now part of the language and he's got an adjective and a noun and a verb named for him. And you know you've really made it when the words that are based upon your own name are spelt all in lowercase. So Mendel deserves his fame. A few years later in 1869, well, the first thing that happened was our university was founded down there by the exchange in that wonderful building, which sadly got demolished. But in that same time, Friedrich Miescher in the University of Tübingen, which was, you see, founded a little earlier than ours, 1477, he was looking at, he was interested to know what the nucleus of cells was made out of. And he got a whole lot of, sounds pretty horrible, uh, pus tissue from the local hospital, was able to separate out the nuclei, and he found something in there which he called nuclein, he actually later called it nucle nucleic acid, which is the NA of DNA, and it was made of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, but not sulfur, which was very interesting at that time. It took him a couple of years to persuade his boss that this should be published. But here it was in 1871. And that was the year that the first students were involved in our university. Well, that's the 70s. Going on to the 70s and 80s, uh, Walter Fleming was a scientist who first saw these string-like 
structures in the middle of a cell. There it is, the, these things here. And uh, he didn't give them the name chromosome. He called them chromosomes. He called them chromatin. Um, but his colleague with this wonderful name on the right there, Heinrich Wilhelm Gottfried von Waldheier Hartz, he called them chromosomes, which simply means colored bodies because they look, they're in a pretty color when you look at them down the microscope. Well, in the 1880s, when Dunedin was the commercial capital of New Zealand, this is how it looked. And this wonderful photo looking up High Street, wonderfully crisp and clear. Um, and there you can see, actually, do please note that uh, every form of powered transport is horse drawn, with the exception of the most modern form of urban transport in that day, the cable car in the middle of the picture there. And we were only the second city after San Francisco to have cable cars. So just putting that historical mark on where we are at. And at this time, had these four chaps got together, they could have perhaps figured out that genes were made of DNA and these were carried in the chromosomes. They all lived in Central Europe and um, Misha and Waldheir actually did get together. I'm not quite so sure. Um, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Fleming and, and, and Waldheir got together. The other two I'm not so sure about. And um, actually um, uh, Mendel was, had his main job actually was as an abbot uh, in the monastery at Brno. So they never got together and did not cotton on to that um, fact of the, the link between inherited factors and DNA and chromosomes. That took, in the early 20th century, Thomas Morgan to work out that indeed genes are carried on the chromosomes and that word gene was finally invented in uh, 1909. I don't know how many of you do Wordle. I used genes as my entry word on four goes of Wordle. It wasn't all that useful, mostly gray letters, as you can see. And actually, it's not a very good word to use because it's got, it's got one letter repeated, two E's. But anyway, on the other hand, I still got the answer in each of those ones. Righto, I digress. So it took till the 1940s for the discovery to be made that DNA was the stuff of heredity, not protein. DNA was thought to be too simple. It can't carry genetic information. It doesn't look complicated enough. We need something complicated like protein, but no, no, no. Oswald Avery, who was a Canadian working in New York, did some experiments uh, on bacteria and <coughs> showed that um, traits passed from one bacterium to another were carried by DNA. And then 10 years later, of course, this extraordinary paper, Watson, James Watson and Francis Crick with their model of the structure of DNA. And they show that DNA is a double helix. That's what its structure is like. And this is arguably the most famous uh, publication in biology of the 20th century. And yet it, here it is in nature. And it's only a letter to nature. And it only takes, actually it doesn't quite take up the full page. So it was succinct. Absolutely, they made their point. And uh, the, the last sentence is absolutely famous. And here it is, this wonderful understatement. And it, whenever you see in a scientific paper, people saying the word, it has not escaped our notice. You know that this is a nod to Watson and Crick. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated, the way the two uh, strands of DNA got together, suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Well, they deliberately understated it there, I think, but everybody knew exactly what they were saying about that um, DNA could copy itself, and that's how genes got passed on from generation to generation. That paper was published in April 25 of that year, and April 25 is now the International DNA Day, so put that in your diaries. Well, the two protagonists here wrote books about it, The Double Helix, James Watson's book, and What Mad Pursuit, Francis Crick's book. But they could not have done their work without two other colleagues. And so going back to their paper here, and let's look right down at the bottom there to the acknowledgements. And we have also been stimulated by a knowledge of the general nature of the unpublished experimental results and ideas of Dr. Morris Wilkins and Dr. Rosalind Franklin and their co-workers at King's College London. And this 
is the work of Rosalind Franklin's student. This, that funny round thing there, is a crystallograph of DNA. And if you know something about X-ray crystallography, that says to the very expert eye, aha, we are looking at a helix. Now, Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin unfortunately got off on the wrong foot for various reasons, and they should have been doing this work together. But actually, Morris Wilkins had shown this photo to James Watson, I think without Rosalind Franklin's knowledge, which would have annoyed her. And, but on the other hand, both of their names are recognized here at King's College London. Rosalind Franklin, who as you see, died young at the age of 38, and Morris Wilkins obtained at King's the first high quality diffraction data on DNA. And these were critical for the determination in 1953 of the structure of DNA. And Morris Wilkins got the Nobel Prize for this work in 1962, together with Watson and Crick. Well, books were written about them as well. Uh, Rosalind Franklin had died, but she had, her author wrote about her. And Morris Wilkins wrote his own book, The Third Man of the Double Helix. Some of you may know that Morris Wilkins is, was actually, he could call himself a New Zealander. He was born in Pongaroa, there in the deepest wire wrapper. You can see it in, uh, towards the coast from Palmerston North. And in the Pongaroa Cemetery, there's this wonderful artwork that you can more or less see it could be a helix and a um, bit of artistic license there. Not nearly as fancy as this rather splendid um, monument to Francis Crick uh, in Northampton, which is where he was born. A bit more understated in New Zealand, perhaps. And on the base of um, Morris Wilkins' uh, plaque, there is this, uh, there, sorry, there is this plaque, and let's look at, read it a bit more clearly. And this is a very fair statement of, of how it was done, uh, who played what role. <clears throat> he and colleague Rosalind Franklin, right, Franklin studied the structure of DNA using DNA diffraction techniques. Their discovery of what appeared to be a double helix enabled Francis Crick and James Watson to deduce the structure for the molecule. In other words, Watson and Crick could not have reached the conclusion they did without this scientific data from Franklin uh, and Wilkins. On the subject of Nobel Prizes, uh, um, uh, Wilkins left New Zealand at the age of six and spent the rest of his life in England. He's one of three New Zealanders to have got Nobel Prizes, one of the others being, of course, um, uh, um, Ernest Rutherford, who was on the $100 note, but they did their work overseas. Only one Nobel Prize has been awarded for work actually done in New Zealand, and that was to Sir John Eccles, who was actually an Australian, uh, for work in the 1940s on the way in which um, nerve impulses are transmitted from one nerve cell to the next. And here's the building that's named after him uh, on Great King Street. And DNA, the, the, the structure of the double helix is used in all sorts of logos. And here it is for the movie Gattaca. And there's the, the, the double helix in a building there, uh, constructed to replicate as closely as possible to the actual structure of DNA. Let's tie it all together with the, the chromosomes. And where did DNA fit into the chromosomes? Of course, Hunt had worked that out back in the early 1900s, but it took until the mid 1950s for our number of chromosomes to be known, and it turned out to be 46. And this was discovered in Lund, a Dunedin sized town in Sweden, in 1956. <clears throat> These two gentlemen were the ones who discovered it, and because of a particular happy accident that happened when they were looking at tissue down the microscope, they could see very clearly. And the number had been thought to be higher than 46. So they weren't sure, could it really be 46? And there was a student who had just joined the lab, an 18 year old, his name was Mai Hultain, and they pulled her over and said, Mai, have a look down here, how many chromosomes are there? She had no preconception and came, it was 46, easy peasy. So she was the third person in the world to know that um, the human chromosome number was 46. I met her at a conference some several years later and she recounted that story to me. Uh, some of my colleagues were slightly sceptical about the total accuracy of her recall, but it was such a nice story that I'm certainly prepared to believe it. Okay, getting a bit closer to our time, the turn of the century and the Human Genome Project. 
And the two key people here are Craig Venter, and I do want you to remember that surname, and Francis Collins. And here they are with uh, President Clinton in 2000, when essentially the human genome, the structure of all the DNA within human DNA was uh, identified and recorded. Well, now, let's talk now about the democratization of DNA. And you may have heard of 23andMe and certain other companies where you can get your own DNA analyzed. And 23andMe was started by Anne Wachiski, who's a, um, she was married to the founder of, one of the founders of, 20, uh, of um, uh, was it not Facebook, um, oh, YouTube, I think. And so she was well able to bankroll um, this company in which she was very interested and she wanted people to be able to test their own DNA and find out all about themselves. Um, her company has been recently taken over by Richard Branson, who calls himself an astronaut. And I mean, I don't know, um, he was weightless for two or three minutes, I think, in his rocket. And um, this was some 60 years after Yuri Gagarin had got down a complete circuit of the world. So I don't know, I think, um, Astronaut might be slightly overstating it. Anyway, I digress again, I must stop it. Um, so there are a number of companies that offer the so-called direct to consumer DNA testing, and most of them are based in the US. The two biggies are 23andMe and Ancestry.com, but there are several others, and they have analyzed samples of some millions of people, and those numbers that I've got in there, 9 million and 15 million, are probably way out of date now. I don't know, it's probably 15 million and 30 million, I don't know. Let's talk about 23andMe, and I can do this because I tried this one myself some years ago, um, because I was interested, and they offer um, DNA testing that you can test your ancestry, where do you come from, and what traits, and I'll talk about traits in a minute, you might have, spend a bit more, and you can learn about aspects of your own health. And so it's very efficient. They send you some instructions, a little tube there that you spit into and flip it over to stabilize the DNA and you send it in the box that they provide you back to California. Easy peasy. Now I want to talk about this and so I have no uh, choice other than to discuss my own results. So my apology for being unavoidably self-referential. Right, -o, my ancestry. Well, no surprises here. No great surprises. I know, I actually thought I was fairly bog standard Anglo Celtic. So I didn't think I was, that, that French and German was a slight, a slight surprise, but in what I know about the family, there are aspects to think, yes, that might be the case. And um, there it is. And they produce this cute little map of the world to show you where your uh, DNA came from. They update it from time to time. So there it says Eastern European 0.2% here. But now, oh, it's gone to Southern European 0.6%, um, 0.6% Italian. And some of the other figures are different um, from the previous one, which doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means that the markers that they're using get updated from time to time and the levels of precision are improved. But I'm not sure about 0.6. I'm not mean, going to be very cool to be Italian, but I didn't think that I even could claim even 0.6%. And they tell you fascinating things it's like where your mitochondrial chromosome, that's the so-called maternal chromosome came from. And so we're all out of Africa and there it is in the capital L there. And there are certain links and, and my particular maternal chromosome was sorted out 37,000 years ago, but all very fascinating, but not new knowledge. And my male chromosome, the Y chromosome started in the same place a quarter of a million years ago. And it's evolved to a particular type that I have, and this was a relatively recent evolution, about 3,000 years ago. Again, okay, all very fascinating, but not unsurprising. We all carry, a, there was a bit of interaction between our species, Homo sapiens, and the Neanderthals when, they, when Homo sapiens arrived in Europe. And we know this from DNA that's been taken from Neanderthal bone samples, of obviously thousands of years old. And so I have a bit of um, Neanderthal DNA, which entitles me, if I so wished, to wear a t-shirt proclaiming that I have 2.9% of Neanderthal DNA. Well, look, I don't wear t-shirts anyway, so I'm not gonna buy that. 23andMe 
every, every, I don't know, month or so sends an email saying, you've got new relatives and all this, a new number of people have come forward and they want to meet up with you and um, discuss the degree of your relationships and you can go and visit them. And so I guess since these people have put their names out there through 23andMe, I can reasonably give their names in this great list here. Anyway, these are a whole lot of people all over the world who <clears throat> are related to me, but most of them are mostly fourth cousins or uh, further away. And there it is, that's 1,500 relatives through uh, 23andMe. It's very clever the way, well, clever, it's, it's very nice the way they show how this is done. So here is a, a, here's a, a, a set of chromosomes going from chromosome number one down to chromosome number 22 and the X chromosome. And they show in purple these bits of chromosome that I share with somebody who may be my cousin. And overall, with this particular person here, I share 3.25% of my DNA. And that's typically the amount of DNA that you share with your second cousin. And they have this helpful little map here to show there's me and this other second person, a uh, second cousin over here with whom I share 3.25% of DNA. And we probably go back to a pair of great grandparents in common. It's very nice the way they present their data. For technical reasons that I won't bother you with, my DNA results also got sent to another outfit called My Heritage DNA, and they again send emails every now and then. Well, good news, we've discovered new DNA matches for you. And in recent times, Dolly there in America and Scott F, I'm sure it's just Scott in, in Britain, Great Britain, and but there are lots of others, and they actually have found 12,011 distant relatives. Just 10 of my extended family have had their DNA, but none of my close family. So I'm the only one of my close family that's done DNA. Well, it was 12,011 a few months ago. They updated from time to time. Now it's 12,505. So um, my heritage is discovering more and more relatives of mine around the world. And then they tell us where they come from, most from America in England and then various other countries, as you can see there. And again, they've got the, these cute maps that colored according to the um, concentration of relatives of mine in these different parts of the world. They, were, they confused me a little. Um, they came up with my ethnicity results, I, Irish, Scottish, or Welsh. I'm sure that Scottish, 54%. I thought I was more 54% English and just 20% Scottish, but well, that's the way they've got it. But what I find quite extraordinary, they reckon that I'm Greek or Southern Italian, 16.7%. That just seems a wee bit unlikely to me, to be honest, just from what I know about my family and what I know about myself. So I think maybe their ethnicity algorithms need fine tuning, or maybe I am really Southern Italian. Right. And then, this is 23andMe, they send data on your traits. So these are characteristic, not diseases, but observations about yourself. <clears throat> Things such as, look at the top there, the ability to match musical pitch. So there is a genetic basis for being able to hear a sound and say, mm, it's B flat. It says I'm less likely to be able to match a musical pitch. And I'm afraid they're right. I, uh, to my sadness, I do not have perfect pitch. And I can smell asparagus. I don't have back hair, don't have a bald spot. I can taste bitterness. and. I don't have cheek dimples, all these things that really, what the heck do they matter? It's more, I don't know, almost um, uh, belly gazing or uh, just to, to amuse yourself about what characteristics you have. But here's one that's, let's go into this a bit more deeply. They, they look at eye color and they say that because of the gene that they looked at, I'm more likely to have blue eyes and there's a less than 1% chance down at the bottom that I've got brown eyes. Well, that's true, I think my eyes are blue. And then you go to the report and work out, so sorry, this is a wee bit technical, but they say looking at a particular reference snip, uh, that, which is near a gene that's to do with pigmentation, that I've got a particular copy of a gene, that means that um, I'm more likely to have blue eyes. Okay, well, bear that in mind, it will become relevant later in the talk. Right. There you go. Well, more important, you might say, is um, risks for diseases. 
and here's a great list of things for which I'm more prone to suffer. Right at the top, venous thromboembolism clots. <clears throat> and, and yet it's only um, one and a half times that of the general population. So there's not a huge difference, but maybe it does mean that were I to do long haul flights, which I don't do anymore, I should wear compressive stockings, but you should do that anyway to be sensible. And the other things there I don't have. So the it's only a risk statement. There's just a probability statement that I'm slightly more likely, but it doesn't mean at the least that I will have those things. Well, now, when I did my test, it was possible to get a whole range of diseases, but the um, FDA in, in, the, in the US clamped down on them in about 2013 or 14, and they can't do that. We couldn't do it for a while, but then they now they're able to do it for, in America, but not for people outside of the US. And there you can get risks about, you might say, rather more important things. Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, age-related macular dystrophy, and I'm well into the age group to being at risk of those. Well, breast cancer and Angeline Jolie, uh, she um, rocket propelled interest in the so-called BRCA, breast cancer genes, that strongly predisposed to breast and ovarian cancer because she had one of those particular genes and had a double mastectomy and removal of the ovaries, as I understand, to avoid the very high cancer risk that is associated with possession of that gene. So have a wee bit of controversy here. Here's what I think about dementia. I don't think it's something one wants to have. And if you knew you were going to have it, I think you should have eligibility to assisted dying. Right oh, let's avoid controversy. Let's go back to what I was talking about. But the gene testing that they did for Alzheimer's shows a very strong, well, it's a pretty strong marker gene that is related to your risk for Alzheimer's, the so-called um, APOE gene, which comes in three different types, the two form, the three form, and the four form. And because our genes come in pairs, people will have a combination of 2, 2, or 2, 3, or 3, 3, or whatever. Now, if you have the 2, 2 gene, that's up at the top there, this line here, you can come along to age 80, and you've got about a 98% chance of not having Alzheimer's disease. And if you, even if you live to 100, you've got an 80% chance of not getting Alzheimer's. So that 2, 2 combination is very, very protective against Alzheimer's. Whereas the 4-4 combination, if we follow this graph down here, by the age of 80, running across there, you've got about only a 10% chance of being free of Alzheimer's. And by the time you get to 90, most people with that 4-4 combination will have Alzheimer's. So we've got one combination, the 2-2, that means you almost certainly won't get Alzheimer's and by a certain age. And the other combination, the 4-4, meaning very likely you will. So this is very powerful information. And then you can possibly see why the FDA in the US clamped down upon making that test widely available some years ago, but as I understand, have more recently reinstated it. So there it is. Um, and um, I'm not going to tell you what my FOE comma is. Well, now, what fish hooks are there in this business of getting your own DNA tested? you might find out that your father isn't your father. Here's the story of a US couple. Michelle was going back to study and she'd been told she had some Native American blood on her father's side. So might she be eligible for scholarships? She traced her father's history back to the 1600s, but ancestry DNA shows that she was half Italian. Well, this can't be right. But ancestry DNA also showed she had cousins in Syracuse, New York, which she'd grown up. Then an aunt told her that her mother, when her mother was 18, she had had an Italian boyfriend. I stood up, my laptop went to the floor, I dropped my phone and ran to the bathroom and started vomiting. The subsequent paternity test of the man she thought was her father confirmed that there was no relation. That was devastating for both of us, said Michelle. And so you have to opt in to get information about your genetic relatives and 23andMe, perhaps burned by some of these events, says in rare cases, <coughs> participation in DNA relatives may reveal that you are related to someone unexpected or that you are not related to someone in the way that you expected. Here's a pretty awful story. A couple, pregnant, discovering that they're related as half-siblings. 
Here it is, they're expecting their first child in March 2020. Our bio father is still alive, but we don't want anything to do with him because of this and because he was an unpleasant person. That would be pretty shattering to discover. Or here, when IVF labs hardly ever, ever, ever make mistakes with embryos and plant and transfer them to the wrong couple, but it can happen. And this happened to these couples who discovered that their eggs had been switched at the time of in vitro fertilization. Well, this young lady here who did a test and discovered that she had a significant African-American ancestry, and they discovered that her grandmother had known this and she could pass for white, but um, she saw it as a source of shame and reinvented herself as a white person. And it was only, she was well and long passed on before her granddaughter here um, did that testing. Um, and so she had never herself revealed that to the family. Um, the family now found it more interesting than um, a source of shame. So uh, attitudes change with generations. Millions of people, as I've said, have been doing these DNA tests and numbers I'm sure are well up above what they were here in 2019. Right, the final part of my talk, the forensic application of DNA. And how, having done a consumer, to, a direct consumer test, can move into forensic testing relating to crime scenes. And the most famous case is that of the so-called Golden State Killer. And here's a meeting in 1977 in a high school building uh, in Sacramento. And all these people came because they were so terrified of serial murders and rapes and burglaries that had been taking place at night in their town. And the police had not been able to track this uh, perpetrator down. DNA had been stored at the time, but technology in those days wasn't able to produce any useful analysis. But very, very fortunately, they kept DNA on store. Then, as they do, every now and then they have cold case reviews. And in the 2000s, they saw, wanted to see if they could match the DNA of this perpetrator through CODIS, this combined DNA index system in the United States. But no match was found. But they were able to link to other crimes and other areas from the same person. So proving the point that he had been responsible for crimes actually all up and down um, uh, California. This was a source of a great fascination to one Michelle McNamara, who as a um, teenager happened to be close by the site of a murder at that tender age and became utterly fascinated with crime solving. And she became, as it says here, her obsessive search for the Golden State Killer an extraordinary book and there's a movie about it and she um, she converted one room of her house to a library to, to a store for all the data that she had been collecting over the years to try and track down who could the golden state killer be well she approached northern californian detectives about her, her quest they fortunately realized that she was very switched on and listened to her and so they spoke to a former new zealander dr barbara ray venter and you all know the name Venter there. Yes, she was married to Craig Venter. She was actually, a, she grew up in Wellington, moved to the US as a young woman and was a patent attorney, uh, attorney. But in her retirement, she became very interested in, in genealogy. And she set about organizing PERP DNA, in other words, perpetrator DNA, to another group called GEDmatch to look for familial links. So let's talk about GEDmatch. Well, GEDmatch is another system, again, organized by somebody in retirement. He and a colleague in this humble cottage in uh, Florida organized a genealogy uh, group, which they called GEDmatch. And what they did, they wanted to help people who might have had their DNA studied through 23andMe and wanted to know if they had relatives who had perhaps done their DNA through some other uh, uh, company. And so what you did, you, you sent your DNA data, you asked 23andMe in my case to send your data to, to GEDmatch, and they then looked to see to whom you might be related. So there's me, my data going to GEDmatch, and they send these lists of 
people who, and that, so there's a list of, of, of names of people who are related to me. And this um, uh, column here, starting with 107 and going down and down and down, that is a, an indication of how much DNA these people share with them. So the person at the top of this file is the one who shares the most DNA and would be the closest cousin out of all this group. So GEDmatch realized that this could be used for forensic purposes and they put together this somewhat hokey ad. And how do they do this? They get DNA from a crime scene and then they look at it the other way around. They then see if this can match with data from any of the other companies who have sent DNA data to their GEDmatch facility. So they got DNA from the Golden State Killer Crime Scene and they looked through all these people and they found two cousins who shared 0.7% of their DNA with the uh, presumed perpetrator. Now 0.7% means that you're a third cousin, on average third cousins will share 0.7% of their DNA with each other and they go back most probably to two great great grandparents. So again the cute little diagram that they show to clarify these interesting points. Now we all have 16 great great grandparents from which we may have hundreds of descendants. So there's the suspect over there. 16 great great grandparents, how many thousands of offspring of descendants would they have had? As I say, hundreds here of surely thousands. That's just too much. But what you do is you look for two third cousins and that enables you to so-called triangulate. And you can get a triangle going back from the suspect, from one of your third cousins to another third cousin. And that just goes back to one single set of great grandparents. So that makes it a far more tractable uh, problem to face. Now I wrote to Curtis Rogers in, in Florida. He was very helpful and he wrote back to me and it's simplest explanation. It's a matter of finding a common ancestor between the crime scene DNA and on the genetic genealogy website and then working back to find the descendant that could be the perpetrator. But it isn't simple. It requires using multiple other websites such as social media, family trees, newspaper, cemetery records, wills, deeds, and more. And you may have to go back to local courthouses and churches or other places to do the research. In the case of the GSK, the Golden State Killer, a person was sent from California to New York to visit a cemetery. Well, I can relate to this sort of thing. Uh, in my days of doing research, I needed to go to the Tikoiti, and this is in the mid, mid, up in Mid-North Island, the Tikoiti um, Cemetery, to track the nature of the relationship in a family in which there was a rare form of a hereditary form of imbalance and ataxia. And by studying this family and working out how they were related to each other, we were able to find the gene that caused that particular disorder. Okay, so triangulation, looking for two third cousins and going back to just one set of great grandparents. And GEDmet could triangulate me and for interest, I put down these, these data. And this is a list here starting at the top of chromosome one and going down all the rest of the chromosomes, hundreds, thousands of people with whom I can be triangulated. And so in this top row here, Claudia Crenshaw, John Harris, and myself um, can go back to a common ancestor on the basis of our sharing this particular segment of DNA that's in that square box there. Extraordinary stuff. So doing the sort of work in the Golden State Killer, they found nine men, descendants of these great grandparents of the likely age range and living in Northern California at that time. So they had nine people. And then Barbara Ray Venter was able to, looking at their DNA, work out that of these nine men, only one had this chance of blue eyes. And the DNA taken from the crime scene indicated the genetic likelihood of having blue eyes. So they thought they had their man. But having found him, how did they confirm it? Well, a bit of skullduggery is involved. And they, the detectives, tailed this fellow. When he dropped, left a cup of coffee at a, a cafeteria, picked it up and swabbed it, or touched a door or went through his rubbish and found his DNA and confirmed that it matched the stored DNA back from the 1970s taken from crime scenes. So there it was, his name was Joseph D'Angelo and last, or two years, August 2020, he was sentenced to 26 consecutive life sentences. He avoided the death penalty only by 
agreeing to admit to all the crimes uh, that had been on the DNA basis sheeted back to him. You'll never get out. Jed Match got sold to somebody who wanted to do it as a, a, a more flossied up company. As you see, they're, they're slightly fancier website here. And they send out emails every now and telling you what wonderful new means they've got to identify people. And another outfit on the US, Parabon, they use your DNA data to work out what you look like. Um, it's based on sex and ethnicity, but then they fill it in with such things over here. You can see um, skin color, eye color, hair color, and freckles. And here is a picture that they generated from the DNA data. And there's the picture of the girl whose DNA was had been tested. Pretty good, pretty good match. <coughs> oh, here it is, sorry, and, and bigger, a uh, bigger picture. And this has been used. This, this company, Parabon, were able to identify the perpetrator of a murder going back to 1986. This lass called child, Michelle Welch, who was assaulted and murdered as a 12 year old. And Parabon, using their own data, you going through GEDmatch and looking at physical characteristics, identified two suspects who were related as brothers. And on the other hand, they haven't updated their system to age it. So there is the their predicted facial appearance. And here's what the this fellow who was shown to be the actual perpetrator, Gary Charles Hartman at the time. <clears throat> but they had taken uh, DNA that, um, from a net that he'd used and as the previous case, matched it to DNA from the, type, the crime scene. The local prosecutor made this wonderful statement. DNA technology is rapidly advancing. If you're a criminal who left DNA at a crime scene, you might as well turn yourself in now. We will eventually catch you. And Hartman is currently awaiting trial. <clears throat> Here's a very recent one. And this, I think, was one of the oldest, 20, a 58-year-old crime. This child assaulted and murdered. And Parabon, again, were able to, looking at DNA from that crime scene to match with a distant relative of the suspect and then to find the suspect himself, who actually, in fact, had died many years previously. What about here in New Zealand? So I'm grateful to Dr. Jill Binhan tonight from the uh, Environmental Science and Research, the ESR, uh, for an update. <clears throat> and actually, we have a lot of DNA stored, uh, 189,000 convicted criminals and 40,000 samples from unsolved crimes. But we in New Zealand don't use GEDmatch or this Parabon snapshot methodology. <clears throat> we do do familial DNA searches, but this only looks at close relatives. And the close relative already has to be on the criminal investigation data bank. And only, actually probably a bit more than this now, but only 100 or so cases, searches in 60, 60 cases since 2004. And one example, a cold case murderer for 2001 was identified in 2008 after his sister had given DNA following a traffic offense, for heaven's sake, which closely matched the crime scene sample. Alexandra Flaus, who's now a lawyer somewhere up north, did wrote a thesis uh, on this very issue. And lawyers probably need to get into it because it needs updating. The science is continuously evolving and it's not comprehensive enough and there's no independent oversight and that will probably happen. Curtis Rogers, wrote this to me, he said something of interest, he believes that New Zealand has by far the greatest per capita use of GEDmatch. And there's the membership ranking in the last 30 days when you wrote that email to me. <clears throat> and of course, we're a much, much smaller country than those other ones. So indeed, we're uh, top users of GEDmatch. So who knows whether my DNA would be useful to solve the crime for one of those relatives of mine in America or Europe or somewhere. Uh, using GEDmatch. So the fact that we're way down here at the bottom of the world doesn't uh, release us from um, the recognition that we may, through our DNA, have the capacity to identify long, uh, dist uh, far distant relatives of ours. Well, of course, obviously enough, that's controversial. But the price may be everyone's genetic privacy. 
is this title, The Creepy Genetics Behind the Golden State Killer Case. And this lady, the Dean of the UCLA School of Law says, we don't have a blood taint in this country. Guilt shouldn't travel by familial association, whether your brother is a felon or an amateur genealogist. Well, that's one for you. So Jed Match realizes that they can be used for this. And they say here, you can have two competing priorities. The first priority is you have an absolute right to privacy. But on the same token, you have a competing priority, which is we have a right to not get murdered. And this author of this book, Inside the Cell, The Dark Side of Forensic DNA, she thinks that this interest in finding our, the identities of loved ones or the killers of a, killer of a relative doesn't trump privacy concerns. It's incredibly hard to say this, but we don't make policies about the civil liberties of our whole society based on the personal feelings of single victims. So Jed Match has changed their methodology or their, their way they organize acceptance of samples. You now have to opt in. Previously, you had to opt out or well, maybe they just did it anyway. Um, but now you have to opt in if you want to allow law enforcement to use your DNA data. Parabon, they make the point that over 50 suspects have been identified through that um, methodology. And Cece Moore, who's their boss, calls this, says that the, she thinks that Jed Match's opt-in policy is, quote, a tragedy for the families who would have gotten answers and perhaps justice in the coming months. <clears throat> but this chap from the American Civil Liberties Union says, our DNA is deeply personal and like a fingerprint that can reveal far more than our, our identity, as I believe I may have shown you. Moreover, the information held by GEDmatch and similar companies can reveal such personal details, not only about their users, but also about dozens, if not hundreds, of those users' family members. The government should not be able to access that information about us without our consent. Right over, what do you think? Now, if we'd had this, this meeting was obviously going to be an in-person one, and I was going to actually call for a show of hands. I can't really do that. I, I, even, even, you, even the wonders of Zoom, I don't think, allow me to count all your hands. And only this, your, your, your pictures are far too small to see, probably. But what do you think? Do you think in this whole business of direct-to-consumer testing and its use for forensic purposes that the balance should be weighted towards catching criminals? Or... Do you think the balance should be weighted towards maintaining privacy? Or maybe you don't know. Righto. Moral of the story. DNA is powerful stuff. John Dunn was right. No man is an island entire unto himself. The law needs to catch up. They're doing their best. And when you send your DNA, when you send your spit sample to California, do so with your eyes open. Know what you're letting yourselves in for. Thank you. Right, so he says he's had identical twin grandsons, indistinguishable in childhood, but now they look and sound different heights and more. What happened to their phenotypes right from the same phenotype? <clears throat> well, um, my first question is, uh, are you quite sure they were identical? Um, there's a lovely test, the so-called 2P test, if two children are as alike as two peas in a pod, then there's about a 98% likelihood that they are truly identical. Um, but if they look and sound different, um, perhaps, I mean, sometimes siblings can look very similar. It depends how uh, firm you are in your understanding that uh, they were identical. But if indeed they were so-called monozygous twins, then we would actually, and, but if they look a bit different now, then we would uh, draw uh, a conclusion based on perhaps a new, newish uh, understanding of so-called epigenetics. And although two twins may have the same content in their DNA sequences, but the way in which they use that DNA, the way in which bits of DNA are used or not used can differ between twins. So all identical twins, usually to their parents, there are subtle differences that um, parents and sometimes others can pick up on. So um, it depends if they really are identical or not. And if they're really quite different now, um, I, I would have a wee bit of a reservation about the uh, diagnosis of identical. And you cannot put any weight on the placentation when they were born. Um, I once did a wee study of what, how people describe placentas and went back to them to work out which placentas were which. 
and um, I think, oh, does it say that? Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, uh, yeah, well, so, so somebody might have said at the time, um, but uh, again, I would be skeptical, having seen how inaccurately people can assess placentation. Most people seem to think they're related to Vikings. So <laughs> right. Um, well, um, uh, we have known from some time ago that um, at about the year 1000, that, that time, um, there were Viking raids on Scotland. And the, so there are uh, Viking, there are Scandinavian genes in the Scots. So, you know, that's, that was worked out um, ages ago, well, well pre the um, uh, subtleties of current DNA methodology. So, um, um, yeah, um, I think I'm perfectly prepared to believe that because I know that I have just on this history, I have a lot of Scottish ancestry, but many of those Scots 800 or so years ago may well have had genetic input from Viking raiders. Mm. Why is it that some geneticists do not respect the concept of a person's privacy? Ah, uh, well, um, <laughs> you might like to uh, expand on that. Um, oh, that, so that the last message is just that's the one, last one down, is it? Right. If people have put there, if you're if you're thinking about the names that I have um, shown on my screen, people from all around the world who are distantly related to me. Uh, they they put their names out there uh, in the public domain, so I, I was perfectly happy to um, use their names if if that's the point that you were wishing to make. In clinical genetics and the practice of clinical genetics, uh, we we are really pretty fastidious about uh, privacy. Thank you, Mac. Uh, John Cornwall has his hand up there, so All right. jump in, John. Thanks, Chris, and hello, Mac. I have a question for you around privacy uh, and anonymity. Um, I, I wonder if it's true that true personalised medicine and the benefits that go with it uh, for descendants and other family members will require a person to waive their right to anonymity. Where do you think the future lies in regard to personalised medicine and, and its potential in regard to anonymity and whether people will waive it. Right. <clears throat> well, as you know, I quoted John Dunn, no man is an island empire unto himself. So whether you like it or not, you share DNA with your siblings and, and all your other relatives. Um, so um, you can't really call yourself autonomous. Um, having said that, uh, as I said, in clinical genetic practice, we, we are uh, fastidious about privacy. Now, in terms of personalized medicine, now look, I've been retired for some time, and I'm not sure that I would like to make some ex cathedra comment about um, uh, its application to current day medicine, other than to say uh, knowledge of a uh, particular genetic factor is often very revealing and useful in terms of I could give a I could give an example of a local case in which I was quite helpful. Um, but I will give no further detail because I respect privacy, of course, uh, but enabled somebody who um, had had to leave employment and uh, for various reasons. Um, anyway, the fact that I was able to identify a rare genetic basis of his condition was very helpful. Hi, John Clarkson here. Um, Mac, can you comment on the um, possible future use of personal DNA by health insurance companies? Right, um, and the, the, not only the possible future use, but in fact the past and present use of um, personal DNA, and perhaps most um, uh, to the forefront in the diagnosis and cancer diagnoses and in um, familial cancer syndromes. So there are a number of fairly rare, but not all that rare, uh, familial cancer syndromes that uh, predispose particular, well, I mentioned the BRCA1, the Angeline Jolie effect, um, breast and ovarian cancer, 
And um, then there's another group of hereditary cancers that go particularly with um, bowel and certain gastrointestinal tract um, cancers. <clears throat> and um, there have been debates with the insurance companies over at least the last two or three decades. And uh, it seems a bit that the one response to this has been a bit pragmatic, but a, a pragmatic, but a wee bit sort of odd. What you do is you, you because it says on many um, forms, um, have you had a gene test for a genetic disease? And so you don't have one. You wait until you've got your insurance and then you have your gene test, which seems it's a bit dodgy, you might say. And of course, if it turns out you have got the gene, well, you're still insured. And if you haven't got the gene, well, maybe you might decide to cancel your insurance. I don't know. But um, the insurance companies are well aware of it. They, they, they want to be seen as reasonably good guys. And so um, there has been a conversation, a debate over the last, as I say, two or three decades about uh, testing in particular uh, for cancer predisposing genes that run in your family. Thank you.